Yeah, yeah, and then I've, I've had the, the privilege to, to work with a, a number of, of uh, really um, really qualified uh, fish people uh, over the years. And, and to be honest, my career, I didn't necessarily intend it this way, but it unfolded, as we'll talk about it, in, uh, mostly in the southeast here, in Kentucky and Tennessee, in a really diverse area. And, and fish are just, a, just absolutely uh, an amazing topic. And so what, what we'll be talking about here uh, are the fish that are found in uh, the central Appalachia region. As we will, um, as we'll talk about. And Ken, I am so sorry. Is that it? Yeah, you're right. Thank you. So what we see is, is this: uh, that as we look at fish diversity, uh, we're in a great spot. Well, not globally, uh, but on this continent, we're in a great spot for fish diversity. We see these general trends that you're familiar with and biodiversity uh, by which biodiversity increases with two things increasing temperature and increasing uh, precipitation so you, you see these trends on the screen with trees and amphibians now reptiles which are kind of partially hidden there so the uh, precipitation is not so important for them but what we notice is this when we look at, at fish diversity not so bad uh, right right here in in kentucky now it's not as good as uh, brazil or colombia or uh, ecuador uh, but it's not bad uh, here in Kentucky. And so we typically come in at number three as far as aquatic biodiversity goes. Um, so Alabama is almost always number one, number one for mussels, number one for crayfish, number one for fish. And then we have Tennessee behind that, which beats us by a little bit. But then we're, we're, we're our number three, which is not uh, not so bad uh, here in uh, Kentucky. So when I started, uh, when Kenton asked me and I started putting this talk together, Appalachia is a big region, uh, isn't it? And so as I, I looked at uh, all of Appalachia there, I'm like, well, there's no way I can talk about the fish in, in all these different areas. So what I'll be talking about mostly are the fish here in central Appalachia, which is where I have the greatest experience. Um, so mostly Kentucky, but I am going to cheat a little bit. And so I'm going to stray outside and I'll, I'll talk about when I do this. I'm going to stray a little south here, um, a little uh, east, I, I suppose, as well, and, and a little south down here to pick up uh, some of the species that, that are found in the mountains there um, that um, I think are particularly interesting, widespread, and, and kind of play an important role as, as uh, having an important story related to conservation. So as we look at fish anywhere here on the face of the earth, what we notice is this, um, that we like to talk about in biology, this idea of the river continuum concept, with which, you're, which you are uh, likely familiar. And the river continuum concept is sort of aquatic ecology's answer uh, to the biome concept in, in, the, the, in a terrestrial setting. The river continuum concept says, as you uh, likely know, are you all familiar with the river continuum concept? So it simply says this, that, that when you start out in the headwater region, wherever, wherever you are, if, if you're uh, down in Brazil, uh, in the, the Amazon basin or uh, in the Appalachian uh, region of Kentucky, the streams look pretty similar. Now that's not to say the species are gonna be the same, but you see these same gen general trends. But when we're up in these headwater streams, we have uh, very low fertility. Most of the nutrients are coming from outside of the stream, uh, as opposed to uh, like having lots of nutrients in the stream and algae being the, the, base, the base of the food chain. Most of the food is washed in from the surrounding forest floor. And the diversity is pretty low uh, as far as invertebrates go, and especially as far as fish go. But then as we go downstream, what we see is this, that the stream gets bigger. Uh, there's a plethora of niches uh, that occur uh, that are available as a result of just the larger size and the abundance of nutrients that occur in these lower uh, areas. And so we tend to increase numbers of fish greatly as we head downstream. And so for the, the bulk of our little discussion here, um, I've divided it up into the headwater reaches, the mid uh, elevation uh, reaches, and then the large river streams, which is really, the, I, I think, the, the logical way uh, to do this when you're talking about the different habitats that are found in Appalachia. So keep in mind, and, and Appalachia is actually pretty, pretty impressive as far as this goes, because the headwater reaches are pretty impressive. You go to the western end of the state, well, I mean, the headwaters are, are okay. You still have small streams, but you don't, they don't have the, the same unique habitats in those low elevation areas that you have in Appalachia. But keep in mind, were you in South America? Were you in Africa? You see the same general patterns. It's just that you would see different, uh, in most cases, different families of fish and certainly different species um, there. So a logical place to start then uh, is uh, up in the headwaters. And the headwaters in many ways are my favorite, uh, my favorite streams. When I was your age, I, I had this weird idea and um, I don't recommend it. 
Um, but um, I do see students uh, do this, and I tell them it's a bad idea, but they never, they never listen. Um, and so I, I really wanted to work with brook trout. I became obsessed with this one little uh, fish. I mean, why would I be obsessed with brook trout? I have all the fish. And I, I wanted to go to grad school and study brook trout, so that's eventually I, I found a spot in uh, Tennessee uh, where I could do that, and that's what I went and did. And it was awesome, don't get me wrong. But what I should have done, this is my advice to you, find the best place that you can go to grad school, the, the place that, the, the absolute best place. It doesn't really matter exactly what you're working with, um, but you'll probably be like my students who just won't, uh, won't listen. I didn't listen when I was your age. So when you look at these headwater streams, th these are awesome streams. Um, remember, this is the beginning of this river continuum concept. Super low diversity here, harsh environments, um, but, but very interesting, uh, really environments as well with, with very unique ecology. And so very low number of species, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about it here, a couple examples of species there, but down to just one, uh, down to, to absolutely just uh, one species, maybe four families there. And we, we find uh, cyprinids, we, we see the minnows occurring there. The minnows are the minnows, Family Cyprinidae are this continent's equivalent of, of rainbow fish in Australia. Like they're the most abundant fish that we find day in and day out in any habitat as we look at the different habitats uh, throughout the, the entire United States uh, for, for that matter. Now we find some others too in these habitats that are less prevalent. And so darters, um, not too many species here, but we'll oftentimes find orange throat darters uh, up in these, these small headwater streams. We find these guys, which are really bizarre that they even occur here at all. And we'll look at a picture of them. And then we'll talk about these little guys, which kind of play a, a special role in the, in the uh, story of the ecology of the southeastern United States. So as I said, these are some of my favorite, uh, favorite habitats there. And, and so, you know, as back in the days, let me put this over here. When I was at uh, working, I, I did that master's in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park park working with the park service and those were back in the days when they got this bright idea they're going to restore brook trout uh, re replace the, the native uh, trout so th these are brook trout brook trout are the only trout that are native to the eastern united states and you know we'll talk about an introduced species later but we as humans have this long sordid history with introduced species that continues to this day but when you're talking about trout these are the only native uh, ones um, they don't quite occur in kentucky but once you get over the uh, over the uh, ridge there in Virginia and uh, well a little further south in Tennessee, uh, you find them. So a lot of that time in the park, well maybe that's an exaggeration. A good bit of the time in the park, we were involved in this project where we wanted to delineate the uh, range of brook trout uh, over in the uh, Cataloochee watershed, which is on the, the North Carolina side of the park. And to do that, uh, what you do, well do you know this? Actually, in your biology classes, do you do this? How do you collect fish? So what's the method of, of collecting fish that's used today? Any thoughts there? Is Krupa still here, right? Do you know Dr. Krupa? No. Yeah, good job. So ask him about this. I think he has that, that old uh, fisher. So we shock fish. You ever shocked fish? Shocking fish is one of the most fun things you can do here on the face of the earth. And so there's different ways of doing it, but but um, the way you do it in these little streams, and ask Krupa about this. So you put on the, this backpack electrofisher. Uh, so it's literally a backpack that um, has a battery, is at least the one we had when I was here, had a battery too, ours does now. And you have these probes, you put them in the water, you put electricity into the water and it stuns the fish. It's actually really good for teaching undergrads because like I tell the undergrads, I can't really take them out to catch uh, coons or possums because they'll get diseases. And, you know, we'll never catch any anyway in a two hour lab. But I can take him out to shock fish. We can get 800 fish in a two-hour lap. I can get them there and get them back in two and a half hours. And get them good. So that's what we're doing up here in these high elevation streams. It was some crazy uh, work. So they, three of us uh, in a team, and they drop you off, and they say, okay, shock until you don't get any more fish. So you're going all day long up these streams, crawling up the, the streams, electrofishing. And the last thing we'd see, the, the very last fish, so you see um, you, you see long-nose uh, dace here. Um, you see, uh, was that a relevant comment? Okay, uh, awesome. I'm so sorry. I'm not very good at monitoring the chat as we're going here. Uh, good, good job for sure. So you see these three species in those streams. Uh, you see long nosed dace, uh, which are a species that likes those high elevation streams. You see sculpin, and what a weird species. So the rest of these guys are, are marine fish, uh, but, but these like these small, cool, high elevation streams. 
Um, you find them in some of the mid elevation streams as well, but they're a really bizarre fish, a huge mouth will eat anything that, that they can swallow. Um, and then brook trout. And as you go up and up and up for miles and miles and miles, eventually the last thing you see in these little like pools the size of a kitchen sink are brook trout. Um, and so in the high elevation streams, super low diversity, but interesting fish and, and interesting, you know, interesting ecology uh, as well. Not many inverts to eat, um, but, uh, but these guys are thriving in those little tiny environments. It is a harsh life. Um, they, they don't live very long. They don't get very big, uh, but they do persist uh, up there. And to some extent, they move up and down. Um, those brook trout can jump pretty well and make their way up little waterfalls uh, in those, those habitats. So leaving those, those habitats and moving down, following the river continuum concept, a little bit downstream, um, what we see is this. Um, that we get to the, the midstream uh, sim fish assemblages uh, next. And so here we've come down out of the mountains. If you like to go to the park, uh, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, you know, think about uh, going on the Townsend side, how the Little River flows through Townsend there. So this is about where we are. Or on the Gatlinburg side, you'd probably be down around Pigeon Forge. Or here in Central Kentucky, um, these are the streams that we find. Uh, so well, well uh, when I was in UK, I guess the Elkhorn was our, our go-to uh, stream that, that we uh, we go to out on Old Frankfurt Pike there. So this is the size stream that we're talking about. So here. We find much higher diversity as, as far as uh, species go. And so we, we typically get, you know, our go to's out in Jessamine County there are Jessamine Creek and Hickman Creek. We get about 35 species of fish in Hickman Creek, which is not, you know, not too shabby. Um, but uh, there's one stream, I guess I won't talk about it again, but down in south central Kentucky, Buck Creek, that you may have heard of, it, it's super famous uh, in Kentucky for its diversity. It boasts 70 species of fish. Would you believe that? 70 species, which is more like almost three times the fish some entire states uh, have out in the Western United States. Um, and so it, it's this super diverse uh, stream known for its fish and mussels. Um, we have a bunch of families here and we'll talk about some of these examples. Once again, uh, some of these species. Once again, cyprinids are super common um, and, and probably highest in terms of number and biomass, but the centrarchids, the sunfish, start to play a big role in the ecology as far as upper level, upper level uh, predators especially uh, go. So a couple examples uh, here on, on uh, our slide. So these, well, some of these are the most prominent and others I, I just kind of included for, for other reasons. Up in the upper uh, left-hand corner there, we have our stone rollers, which are the rabbits of the, uh, th these habitats. So they're the primary herbivores by far. You go to these streams and electric fish, and there are just clouds of these things that come up. The density is really pretty impressive. Like go down to, to uh, Elkhorn, uh, fairly close to here. It's amazing the density of stone rollers. They have this cartilaginous plate, um, which is, uh, I mean, they're pretty distinct anyway, but a way that, that uh, I talk to students about IDing them. And they put it right down against the rock. And as they swim, they're scraping algae off the rock. And there'll be these big crowds of stone rollers all moving together along the bottom. You know, most of us have probably seen those. If we've been wading in a stream or up on a bridge looking down at a stream, all moving together. Some of these other guys are big players too, though. So we have striped shiners, which are not as abundant uh, density wise, uh, but they're, they're insectivores uh, here and, and almost always show up in these mid sized streams. You know, river chubs are kind of hit or miss right here, but as you make your way uh, further into the heart of Appalachia, uh, they're much more common. Um, if you go like to the, uh, the gorge, go to the, the Smokies, you find these as. Extremely uh, common members of the uh, fish assemblage there. These guys are not quite as common, but they're they're a super um, really beautiful fish, um, and I included them for that reason. They're insectivores of the uh, the minnow family, and I thought it would be helpful. You know, you can talk all you want, but it really I, I don't know how that effective that is in getting the point across. This is not my video, and I forgot the guy's name. He's got his little ID up there, so I'm kind of, I'm sorry, Chubb Mount uh, is his, uh, his username. I'm not trying to, to steal his video. I meant to give him credit, but it's a great video. And so here we see the fish, many of the fish that I just talked about here. This is the Little Tennessee River, which is actually a, kind of a, a famous river in uh, down around Tennessee there. Snail darter, does the snail darter mean anything to us? Um, one of the big, yeah, one of the, the big chapters in, um, the environmental, the history of, of uh, conservation in, in the United States, a really interesting case. So there are no snelters in, in this picture, but these guys are, are the river chubs that we mentioned earlier. See if, see if you believe this. So the river chubs 
uh, piled together rocks, and you can see them. Uh, like this is a river chub. That one up towards the top there. I, is it going to mess up my point? Yes, it is. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, is a striped shiner. Um, and so the river chubs are picking up rocks and moving them uh, together to, to form a nest. The males put rocks together. Just one male puts rocks together to form a nest. And the nest of one male weighs over 100 pounds. Would you believe that? The first thing he does is move all the other rocks out of the way. And then he goes and gets rocks that are about a centimeter. Because you know, these things aren't very big. They supposedly max out at 13 uh, inches, which I, I've never seen one that big. So he picks up one rock at a time and piles them until he has a huge pile of rocks. I remember being in the gorge on the bridge, the Blue Bridge over Indian Creek. If you've ever gone in that way through the Native Tunnel, if you look down there, this was in May. Um, you can see these big nests that river chubs are putting together uh, in the, the clear water in the Red River there. Um, but um, in many ways, there are keystone species in these habitats because as many as 30 other species come and lay their eggs uh, in these nests. And so you see these other guys hanging around. These are the river chubs, but we have striped shiners. You'll see a smallmouth bass at some point. I think I missed him uh, moving by. These are little uh, Nicoma, uh, Nitropus, excuse me, species, the, the brightly colored uh, red ones there. But this is really kind of the environment that you see in, in these streams. So it's a busy environment. Like it's, there's lots and lots of, of uh, fish there. Um, and it's unfortunate that we don't always go snorkel and look at them like this. But when you electrofish, you don't get to see them in, in action like this, but you get to you know, collect them and, and um, process them. And uh, I mean, we, we let them go, but, but measure them. In, Collect ecological data uh, on them. So, what's that mean? Looks like it's sure. Okay. There we go. Thanks a ton. Sorry. Okay, so I'd be remiss uh, if I talked about these midstream fish assemblages and didn't miss uh, mention these guys. So a lot of people devote their lives uh, to, to these fish, and I could see I could see doing that. So these are the darters. Uh, darters are these amazing uh, species of fish. Uh, several hundred species uh, exist throughout the southeastern United States, um, and uh, and what what we notice is uh, this: people love to love the, these uh, darters. Uh, darters are similar to, you know, you're familiar with cichlids uh, and uh, the, the diversity of cichlids, 300 species of cichlids in Lake Victoria before the introduction of Nile perch. Darters remind me of those guys. So they're these very unique fish. I think we have some, some nice pictures on, on the next slide. They have this very unique behavior, uh, very unique ecology, and there's just so, so uh, many of them. Um, what we have in the lower uh, corner here is, is a, a fantail darter, the same lower corner here. Probably the most abundant uh, of the uh, darters that are found in, in Appalachia. And these are probably four of the, the most common species uh, that, that we observe, um, but they're just incredibly uh, interesting fish. The fantail darter, for instance, um, when it reproduces, uh, it lays its eggs underneath a flat rock. So it's underneath the rock. And this is a male. The male has little egg mimics that are on the top of its dorsal fin. And why would you want egg mimics? I think I always tell students, fish are not deep thinkers, at, at least in this case, they're not. And so the male uh, sits under the rock and he elevates himself. So these little egg mimics are pushed against the bottom of the rock. The female comes along and looks at him and says, oh, he must be pretty successful. He's already, he's already got some eggs that he's guarded because that's how their biology works. So I'll probably mate with him and, uh, and, and invest my DNA with him. Um, and so th there's all these little quirks that, that are associated with the, their uh, reproductive uh, behavior. But darters are certainly a, a one of the most interesting components of the, these uh, kind of midstream, mid uh, elevation fish assemblages. Up on the upper left, oh, upper right, uh, I guess we have a, a rainbow darter. This is a rainbow darter. That's actually back in my grad school days in uh, uh, Elkhorn uh, that I was referring to earlier. And the upper left hand corner is a green side. They're not always that brilliant, uh, but when the, their spawning time comes along, then, then they become super, super brightly colored. Um, these guys spawn in the fall. The rest of them spawn in the spring. These guys never do color up very much. They're they're really not uh, not extremely sexually dimorphic. Um, one of the most important uh, families within the midstream elevation um, group are the the sunfish. And so fascinatingly, um, the the uh, sunfish fall into this uh, family Centrarchidae. When you hear sunfish, you think what? 
Yes, sir. <laughs> the mola bolus. Yeah, that's a good. That, that's definitely a good thing to, to think about. And so it, it illustrates the problem with common names to some extent, doesn't it? So when I say sun, sunfish here, um, sorry, I should just use scientific names, but I mean centrarchidae. Um, and so um, I, I kind of thought you might say bluegills, um, which is what a lot of people uh, think of when, when they hear sunfish, or, or maybe the long ear sunfish, like what we have up here. But interestingly, this centrarchidae includes a couple different genera, one of which we have depicted on the screen, the, the lipomics. And so these guys are very common members of, of these mid-elevation uh, streams. They're, they're typically insectivores, maybe a little piscivory, maybe a little consumption of fish when you get into guys like the warmouth and maybe the green sunfish. And they also exhibit different levels of sensitivity to, uh, to anthropogenic disturbance, uh, to, to disturbance of a habitat uh, by humans. And we'll mention green sunfish again in just a moment when we talk about the impacts of coal mining on uh, Appalachian Appalachian streams. So I also include just very briefly uh, pictures of long ear. So these are not, you know, these are not a coral reef fish. These are fish found here. In fact, the most common uh, of the centrarchid fish that, that are found in the streams here in central Kentucky. And those colors are not too shabby, uh, in, in my opinion. Now these are breeding males uh, in the spring when they're they're breeding. This is actually hit me, hit, uh, elk horn once again, and uh, that's that's not our picture, but they're really super impressive as far as their colors go. Lastly, I think, is it last, uh, in this, uh, there's one more, uh, in this, these mid-level assemblages, um, we have the, the more piscivorous members of family Centrarchidae. And so into this category falls primarily members of the genus Micropters. Um, and so these are what we refer to as uh, basses. And so you probably know them because the most popular sport fish in North America is what? Who's your, your buddy has a boat and he likes to fish for what? In fact, the boat's even called this. Bass boat, right? And so interestingly, uh, largemouth bass that you see here, in fact, this is the world record largemouth bass, are the most popular game fish in North America. And we'll mention them again when we talk about the reservoirs that are, it's, uh, contributes to, I guess that sociological aspect contributes to some of our environmental uh, problems. But these guys aren't members, they're, they're native to Kentucky and members of this midstream fish uh, community. These are our bass, Kentucky bass, it's a common name, uh, also known as spotted bass, uh, crumpers, uh, uncleatus, which are in some ways difficult to distinguish from, from a largemouth bass. These are probably the most common top predators in, in these uh, mid-elevation systems. Once you get down out of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park right there at Townsend, no more trout, uh, but, but smallmouth uh, show up and smallmouth persist until you get down into the, the lower elevations where these guys start to become more common. Rock bass are also common, along with uh, smallmouth and mostly piscivorous as well uh, in, in these uh, habitats. I included a couple other oddballs here that, that I thought were interesting as we, we uh, passed the, this point. So one of the probably most interesting groups of fish in, in all of Appalachia are the mad toms. Um, and so I'm uh, sorry to use, use a common name here, but the mad toms are a member um, of the family Ictoluridae, which are the catfishes. And they are essentially miniature catfishes. We have over 30 species uh, of these guys that exist total. The stone cat is the most common one uh, that, that we find in, in the Eastern region of Kentucky, although we do have several other species. Um, so the stone cat maxes out, mm, actually I have a little bit of doubt there. I've never found one over, over seven inches in length. Most of the bad toms are smaller. Um, so they're, they're certainly members of the catfish family, but they never reach sizes uh, over just a few inches in length. The one at the top is a real oddball. Um, and so Labidistes siculus, the Brook Silverside. I remember being at Rock Creek in McCurry County and uh, watching a smallmouth uh, follow one of these little guys. They're, these guys, based on that body style, where would you predict that fellow lives? Mm, where in the water column? Let me be more specific. Bottom, middle, or top? It might be tough. Yes, sir. Exactly. Yes, sir. Right there at the top. They're, they're these weird fish. We almost never get them shocking for reasons I don't totally understand. Shock all day, don't get any, but you get the same now and pull it through and you'll pull some in. But back to that smallmouth story. So when they're pursued uh, by a predator, what do they do? They skip like a rock. Remember the, the smallmouth approaching it and you'll commonly see this boom, 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 right across the, the top of the water. Um, there's two species that are found in Kentucky. One is Western and not found in Appalachia. 
Um, and the rest of these guys are Marine. Exactly how these guys ended up this far inland, I, I'm not, I couldn't have an intelligent discussion with you on that, but, but it's interesting that they are part of our ICTO fauna uh, here in this region. Guys, the last part of the, this river continuum concept uh, is our uh, big rivers. In many ways, the, the big rivers uh, hold the most interesting fish. They're harder to access. Um, uh, they're harder to access because you're not going to wade through these areas uh, and electric fish. Even with the boat electric fisher, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be hit or miss. And so you can run gill nets, these, these nets that go down to the bottom, um, or you can run trap nets, different sorts of things. But, but these organisms are, um, you certainly have higher species numbers here. There's just more niches uh, that are available. There's higher levels of nutrients. These are big uh, systems. And what we notice is this, that we swap uh, families as far as the dominant uh, members here. So Castomidae, which are the suckers, are typically the dominant members in terms of biomass here. And we'll look at some examples there. You can see this even, even if you're canoeing down like the, the Elkhorn. If you ever canoe like, uh, what is it, Forks down to Knights Bridge, you ever do that little stretch? And you look down in the water, you'll see some of the species I talk about next down there at the bottom. I mean, that's the 50 to 100 of them at some of those junctions if the water's clear, just hanging out there on the bottom. We also have some, we, we still have the centrarchids, which are listed right here. But we have some other really interesting top predators. The assassins show up, and we'll talk about them momentarily. And the, the uh, ictalurids, we, we did talk about them in terms of mad toms, but here we have our actual uh, catfish species that attain large, uh, large sizes. So briefly, the catastomids, uh, by far the most dominant member, almost always in terms of biomass. And so these guys are, are almost always insectivores. They feed, as you likely uh, realize, by moving along the bottom. Um, I don't have a good picture of this, but one of the, the students' favorite things to do to hold these guys, a northern hog sucker, kitten, what do they do? They, they pretend like they're kissing, the northern hog sucker is kissing him because as you pick it up, I, I don't think it hurts it too much. I mean, I try to keep an eye on it, uh, don't let them keep it out of the water too long, but their mouth goes like that because they swim all day long uh, along the bottom. So when we sample fish in some of these bigger areas, we take a bunch of these and uh, these guys are, are certainly interesting fish. They do make their way back up into the midstream uh, habitats, mid, mid elevation to some extent, but more common in the bigger streams. White suckers, much more common in the bigger streams, a similar niche to, to the northern hog sucker. Those guys, almost, almost exclusively big rivers. So the moxostoma, there are a bunch, maybe eight moxostoma species uh, found within the Appalachian region. And they, you know, I might be overstating their size a little bit, but to me, they seem big. Two, two feet long plus is a, getting to be a pretty big fish. And then uh, the, uh, the quillback uh, carpiote, uh, cyprinus, is exclusively, to the best of my knowledge, a big river uh, fish. I've never seen it anywhere except in, in the larger river uh, systems. There are others as well. Buffalo are a super interesting one. There were some uh, papers published recently regarding buffalo age. How long, how long would you expect a big fish? So buffalo are big. Yeah. Should include some fish, maybe this long or so. How long would you expect that fish to live in the Kentucky River? Thanks. Yes, sir. Thanks. See, that's such a good answer. This study, this was, I think it was worth at Virginia Tech, 80 years. Would you believe that? 80 years, which really made me reevaluate, uh, you know, ever collecting any of, of those guys. I don't want to kill those fish. It's going to live 80 years, uh, certainly. I'm suggesting they all live uh, that long, but I had this. Uh, slide of an odalisk that, that they published, uh, just taken from their pub. And 80 years is, is what it was. So some of these guys are really long-lived uh, fish. These are exciting. Uh, I, I got to be honest. I mean, these are you know kind of kind of traditionally people get excited about uh, catfish, um, but um, but they are super interesting fish, and, and they are native uh, to, to Appalachia. Um, so starting at the top, we have our blue catfish. Um, uh, Ictalurus furcatus, and so blues, blues get big, you know, 120 pounds. If I'm not mistaken, I meant to, to Google this and look it up again. Wasn't the one from the Ohio uh, 120 pounds that was caught a couple years ago? Is that our current state record? I have to look and see. Um, but but they get they get to be they get to be good size. Now flathead, uh, excuse me, uh, channels shown right below, are exclusively big river uh, kind of fish, uh, unless we get into lakes and we talk about this. Um, channels are, are not as big, but you know, 40 pounds is no slouch, so, so they still get to quite large. But by far, my favorite are the flatheads, Pylodictus oliveris. What a fish uh, here on, on the bottom! 
And so these guys differ a little bit from the other catfish in that they only eat live things and they, they get to be massive. I mean, the overall size is comparable to the blues. 120 pounds is, is the biggest I'm aware of from uh, Fort Loudon, which is a reservoir a couple of years ago. Um, but uh, mainly nocturnal and a beautiful pattern. This doesn't show, this is from uh, Missouri. I, I think I borrowed this from, from their site. Um, so it doesn't show the, the color pattern uh, too much, uh, but uh, they have a beautiful uh, pattern uh, overall. Um, we do have some other uh, species uh, found in Appalachia. Uh, Amarius are the bullheads. Um, so this is a, our a very common uh, species of bullhead found throughout Appalachia. I probably should have included it in the mid elevation stream. Um, you pick it up low density, but but you typically pick it up in those streams as well as uh, down in, in the larger streams. Now these guys do get big, and so on the uh, left hand side we have some uh, some of or if I'm not mistaken from Virginia, they're definitely from Virginia Tech's uh, grad students with a big blue catfish on an electric fishing boat. My friend Sean with a, a flathead. I was asked at a faculty lunch the other day, so what about the catfish in the, in the, the river that get to be the size of Volkswagens? And what was my answer? They don't exist. So that's why I included this picture, which is just a goofball picture. Um, and so I, I'm open to data for sure, but uh, you know, if we don't ever, if we haven't caught one in 100 years that's bigger than, than 130 pounds, I, I'm going to have my doubts. I will say, Pat Cease, who worked with Larry Page, he said they used the blues used to get to be 300 pounds. Um, and so you ought to look into it. However, is it one going to get that big? Is it one going to get to be at least 200 these days? I don't know. So one of the most common things people tell me, if you're just trying to make casual conversation and they know that you do something with fish is, what about those fish below the dam that are the catfish that are as big as Volkswagens? Uh, you hear it over and over again, but um, you know, show me one and, and, and I'll, I'll be on board for sure. Now these guys, uh, these guys do uh, get to be as big as a Volkswagen, or nearly so. Longer, at least, I guess. How long are Volkswagen? Bugs. I'm not sure. Maybe not quite as long. Um, but these guys are, are big. And so talk about an interesting big river fish. Family, uh, Lepistos today, the gar. Um, and so what we see is uh, this, that um, gar, these are alligator gar, and I've cheated a little bit here because this is... Um, Outside the, the uh, realm of Appalachia, these, these are found a little bit further to the west. They are in Kentucky, but just barely. But within Appalachia, we do have these guys. And, and so gar are living fossils. If you went back to the, the time of the dinosaurs and, and uh, saw the, the T-Rex walking around, the fish would look completely different except for these guys. And so gar would, would be unchanged uh, from, from that time, um, fascinatingly. And so... What I see, Ken, is that I have not done a good job managing my time. Can I, is it okay if I skip and, and talk about uh, some of the problems facing Appalachia um, briefly as we close here? So, um, we covered most of those, so skipped a, a couple of the species there. And, and so, if we look at the, the problems facing aquatic biodiversity in Appalachia, one of the number one problems that, that people would mention, maybe the number one problem, is this. Well, actually, it's this. And so what do we see in the picture there? A dam. And so I always ask students this question first. How many lakes do we have in Kentucky? Are we, are we comfortable with this question and familiar with it? And the answer is zero, pretty much. I mean, real foot, sometimes people count real foot, but it does, the water doesn't even, it's not even within the, the boundaries of Kentucky. And so, you know, students are typically confused. What's Cumberland? What, what's Laurel? What are all these things? Well, they're reservoirs. They're reservoirs. And so this is the dam at Lake Cumberland creating Lake Cumberland, which is not a lake at all, but a reservoir. And so these things are scourges. I mean, they're, they're blights on, on biodiversity. And so if we look at the, the uh, stat up there, this is from last year. So of all the species that were declared extinct in the United States, in, in the United States in 2021, eight of them were mussels. And all eight of those mussels we're from the southeastern United States. And every, well, maybe I should stop short of here. I, I bet that everyone that, I, that I've looked at, dams were a contributing factor. Um, and probably that was true for every single one. And so this was a huge, it, it, and remains to this day, and you know, to some extent the damage is done, and you, know, you understand the sociological problems uh, associated with it. But think about what a dam does. So you have this beautiful free flowing river that you spent time in the Big South Fork area. You ever canoe down the Big South Fork? Highly recommend it. You can go for, for several days if you start up at Tennessee at Leatherwood Ford and see not, not even see power lines. But then you go through Devil's Jump there, 
and down past Yamacroft, and boom, you run into the lake, the lake uh, Cumberland. And so then you go from this beautiful river with class four rapids and all kinds of things to this just reservoir, and the water's just sitting there. And so you go from this beautiful, you know, water swept bottom with all kinds of mussels and fish in it to this muck uh, on the bottom. And so you destroy, when you build a reservoir, you destroy the habitat for hundreds of miles above stream. That, that's maybe a bit of an exaggeration. At least Norris is 200 miles above it. I'm a little uncertain what Cumberland is. So with the Western ones as well, which would be outside Appalachia are 200 miles. And you destroy the habitat downstream as well. And you've probably been to, to the area below the dam there. You understand that, that the water fluctuates tremendously. It goes way up and by way, I mean like four feet up and then four feet down in a 30 minute uh, time period. Um, and so you have tremendous erosion on the banks. So essentially you've wiped out the habitat for these species for 200 plus miles, uh, maybe 300 miles in, in some cases. And, and we have paid a tremendous uh, price for that in terms of biodiversity. And also, I mean, it's fair to point out, you know, as you compare a reservoir and a lake, they don't even resemble one another ecologically. I mean, it's just barely resemble one another at all. You can talk about the hydraulic residence time. You can talk about all, all these limnetic uh, you know, aspects of, of the limnology, but just look at it. So here's Lake Cumberland. Oh, so here's some real lakes. Like Okeechobee, Crater Lake, Yellowstone Lake, and then Lake Cumberland. I mean, do they resemble each other in any way? Absolutely not. So a reservoir is essentially this big, um, long, uh, it's just a place where the river has been slowed down. And it really uh, wreaks havoc on the, the surrounding uh, habitat. Maybe we could close, we have time for this, Ken, close with introduced species. Um, and so introduced species are an issue everywhere in terrestrial and aquatic systems. Um, and what we notice here is that this, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not a terrestrial biologist, so you should ask one and, and see what they think. In my mind, they hit aquatic systems a little more uh, than, than a terrestrial system. So, and what we see uh, is that uh, we have all kinds of introduced species uh, that impact the native species in, in aquatic systems. Most notably today, um, silver carp. And so you're familiar most likely with the silver carp introductions and, and the almost constant discussion of that. Take a look at this. So this, this is a little outside Appalachia, but these things are making their way rapidly towards us. So here we're electrofishing down below the uh, dam there at uh, Kentucky Dam. So those are all silver carp, all introduced uh, fish. Um, and you understand, well, as far as EDNA goes, there's, there's David Lodge and his, his uh, group are spending, they're spending tremendous amounts of effort. Trying, they have these electrical barriers in place in the Great Lakes, trying to keep these guys out of the Great Lakes. Because like all these other things that have gotten into the Great Lakes, sea lampreys, uh, zebra mussels, for instance, if they get in, there's no going back. Um, and so they have big electrical barriers and they test for eDNA to see if any have made it through the first barrier. Um, and maybe this would be a good point to, to close, but you know, have we learned our lesson and, um, and uh, stopped our, our introduction of, of non-native species? And the answer is no, not by a long shot. These are interesting questions and I, you know, I'm not suggesting the answers are easy. But, um, you know, the, the social dynamics of this it, it plays such a tremendous role. So take a look at these guys, rainbow trout, the most widely introduced fish on the planet. Uh, people love to, to love rainbow trout and, and they love to stock them. And so even in Kentucky today, this is Kentucky right now. If you've ever been down to the, the hatchery uh, below Lake Cumberland there, I mean, you see acres of trout that, that they're raising there. And we stock a million trout throughout the state. Um, each year uh, from uh, from that hatchery down there. And actually, that's just rainbow trout. So we're also stocking brown trout. And now I suppose uh, uh, some cutthroats, a small number of cutthroats as well. Yeah, we have, we've gotten a lot better. Don't get me wrong. We've gotten a lot better. Um, so we don't stock them in places where they're endangered species. Um, and I mean, one good thing you could say about trout in Kentucky is this. What happens to trout when June rolls around? Kind of a weird thing too. They die. It gets too warm. They need cold water. So yes, we, we throw trout in all these different places, even you know even these little lakes in Nicholasville, close to where I teach there. I throw them in Lake Mingo in the middle of the town. People <laughs> people fish for them uh, all uh, all winter, and then you know June comes around and, and they die. Um, so we are funny as people for sure, but introduced species are, are certainly this gigantic uh, deal that, that continues to, to threaten aquatic biodiversity. Guys, thanks a ton for listening. Um, I'll, I'll stop there a little bit over my time. And, and see if we have questions. Thank you. And for three questions.
Yes, yes. So it was an awesome question. The question is, why haven't GAR evolved? Um, why are why are they this this living fossil? Why haven't they changed in all these years? Well, I should first say I'm not qualified to answer the question. I'll do my best. You should you should ask Larry Page or or you should ask David Eisenhower or an, an atheologist and see what they say. But my guess would be this. Um, my guess would be that that um, you know it's it's like most of the ways we look at evolution that there's really they're pretty successful and pretty good at what they do. And they do have some advantages. And so this is one of the things that really fascinates me about GAR. They can live out of the water. Did you know that? And so they have a, a connection uh, between the uh, their uh, swim bladder and their, um, their their mouth. So they gulp air. And that's one of the common things that you see them do coming up to the top. So they can exploit habitats that, that no other fish, except for bowfin, which I, I didn't talk about, um, which are also sort of a living fossil can do. So that would certainly give them a leg up. But it, it, it is an interesting question, and I don't know that I could offer more insight into it than that. I mean, they must be. I, I would assume that we'd have to answer it. Uh, would you agree that nothing else has come along that's good enough to push them out of that that niche? Um, it's a great question, though. Aren't they fascinating fish, though? I just find them fascinating uh, to, to no end uh, to look at. To hold those, those gar, um, they're just an amazing fish. Other yeah yeah <laughs> yeah probably uh could <laughs> most likely it's a, it's a great question um I, I think fish is a tricky thing uh you know i i, I think um so we have 270 Two and am I right? Is that what I said in the earlier on the slide? It's two hundred seventy something species of fish in the state. I can't identify all of them from a long by a long shot, and I'm kind of out of practice in some of the ones down in Tennessee too. So the, uh, was it Josh? Uh, there's certainly some that, that are misidentified. Uh, Josh, I, I'm sure that some of those black nosed days, as we identify them, and I, by we I mean myself in classes. Uh, to be honest, in classes we probably misidentify a lot of them. But Josh, we are. I don't know if I made this clear. We do scoop them up. So the, the procedure goes, we're collecting them, keeping them in buckets with aerators, and then we sit down and we go through an ID them and, and put them back. Typically, we have these little net cages that we put them back to into the water. But it's a good question, that, you know, and that's, uh, it, it's certainly a good question. I, I know that I, I make mistakes, um, and, and, you know, it's kind of a big deal. Matt Thomas is uh, an ichthyologist in, in our state, uh, really our kind of our state ichthyologist, our state non-game person. And... Um, I had to have conversations with him, and, and rightly so. I, mean, I don't even think about comparing my fish IDs uh, to Matt's. But when we apply, for instance, for permits to collect in Buck Creek that I mentioned earlier, there's a Buck Creek darter that, by the way, he, he described, hey, this is a good example to a good thing to add to your question. So I had to, to talk to him about, could I could I identify the, the Buck Creek darter? Because, of course, I don't want to mess with the endangered species. And by the way, he identified that species based on collected specimens. So people. Uh, over all these years, had collected them. They were in collections in eastern and, and um, western, and, and maybe maybe here. Um, and so that's a good example of, of misiding fish for sure. It's a great question. I think fish is tough. One more question. Sure. It's a good question. It's another one that I, I'll, I'll do my best, but, but you, I don't know that I can answer completely. One thing is the drainage. Uh, so these fish evolve in certain drainages. And so we are in the Kentucky River drainage where the little university is located at uh, Asbury. And so when we go down to Buck Creek, we go over the ridge and we're in the Cumberland River drainage. The Cumberland River drainage has a lot of fish that we don't have. It's just more diverse uh, to begin with. Now, as you start to compare one streams in the Cumberland River drainage, I might struggle a little bit to explain to you why Buck Creek has more species than Rock, uh, Rock, the Rock Castle River and these other streams. But it's a great question. I think we'd start with the, the drainage uh, and then and then we'd have to think about it. It's a good question for sure. Well, it's a, it's a good, but that, maybe it does come back to that a lot, Ken. So sometimes I'll talk to, I've occasionally 
talked to, to biologists and they said, well, a lot of what you see in these streams is the result of historic anthropogenic disturbance. For instance, mussels, there's 40 something species of mussels in Buck Creek. In Hickman Creek, which is near us, which is similar, there's two, perhaps. And then why? And, and so apparently that, that's a result of this abuse of the Hickman Creek uh, previously with uh, all kinds of mill dams and, and disturbance. And mussels, you know, what's a mussel going to do? You want freshwater clams to swim back upstream to recolonize. So perhaps you're right, Ken. Perhaps it's a greater history of more pristine as we've gone through the, the years. It's a good thought. Let's thank our speaker again. If you have other questions, just come out. Thank you. So let's go. Any, anyone in the chat, feel free to drop questions in. Thanks for coming.